on detainees. Uh, there are steps to try and um, speed up the, the process of processing, um, of, of dealing with cases. So um, at the different levels of the courts, um, we've got district, regional, high courts, and high courts, um, there are, um, depending on how old a case is, there are, a case becomes a backlog case and then gets given priority. So there is that, uh, that element, um, uh, yeah. Then um, the, 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 um, the questions relating to access, or sorry, to the Regulation of Interception of Communications Act, I think the best would be for us to uh, provide, it, it would be useful if we can get the actual detail of the questions um, uh, and then to provide uh, written responses, but maybe just to note that, um, you know, we have a, a well-acknowledged uh, Bill of Rights which uh, provides for rights of privacy. Um, every law is, is uh, has to be constitutional. It is um, quite often that the constitutional court r uh, rules that, that certain provisions are unconstitutional. I'm not aware of any application having been made or having succeeded on the constitutionality of, of RICA. I am aware and I've seen the right to know submission and I know that they are represented here. Uh, we did have a meeting with them on the cyber crimes bill and they have indicated that they would like to meet with us on the uh, their concerns about the regulation of, of an interception of communications act and we will be meeting with them in in the near future uh, but if we can supply further detail on that at a, at a later point um, the um, the one issue on on the um, polygamy um, in terms of the um, I can't remember the exact name of the piece of legislation but the um, regulation of uh, or recognition of customary marriages act. Um, the point we were making is that it is not gender specific. So that law, it doesn't say a man can take um, more than one wife. Uh, there's no gender specific term. So we were just simply raising it may be possible for polyandry to take place under that act as, as well. Um, on the issue of, of um, the Independent Electoral Commission and disability um, uh, rights, there is a disability policy that, that has been adopted by Cabinet. Um, it does um, provide for, uh, um, uh, for um, it does provide for, for um, measures to, to assist disabled people uh, participate in elections, uh, we can supply you with that that policy. I think that is the best that we, we do on that. On the issue of um, uh, the, 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 there were questions raised about the monitoring of facilities. Now we had raised that in terms of the optional protocol on prevention of torture, that that is one of the things that we are engaging with the Human Rights Commission to try and plug the gaps uh, that, are nest that are there regarding the monitoring of facilities that are um, not covered by uh, either the some other kind of independent body, the Judicial Inspectorate of Prisons and, and um, the Independent Police Investigating Directorate, the Civilian uh, Secretariat of the Police. So we do recognize that as a uh, as a gap, we are looking at, at how to, uh, to correct that. Then on the issue of the uh, missing persons, in the opening statement on a footnote, um, there was reference to the National Prosecuting Authority establishing a missing persons task team in 2005 in accordance with the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's recommendations. Um, Thus far, 101 uh, bodies have been recovered and 89 of those have been positively identified. Uh, these remains have been returned to their families. Um, the task team has a further 500 cases of missing persons currently under investigation. Um, but obviously their ability to recover uh, depends on information that they can, uh, that they receive. With regard to the um, case
cases from the TRC, the, the criminal investigations. Uh, there were in the region, I, I, I would have to give you the correct statistics, but there were about 300 um, that were handed over to the National Prosecuting Authority. Um, remember, one needs to remember though that um, evidence that was given before the Truth and Reconciliation Commission cannot be used um, against a person in a criminal uh, court of law. So in order to, to basically prove criminal acts, uh, there would have to be basically new, new evidence. One couldn't make use of, of admissions uh, made in the TRC process. Uh, my recollection is there's only about seven cases on which uh, there are decisions outstanding. The uh, four people arrested for the dis murder and disappearance of Nokutula Simelane, uh, that case has, has just been instituted. Uh, they were charged last month. Uh, they were released on, on bail um, and uh, a date is then uh, being awaited for the trial to be, to be conducted. Um, then on the issue of the human rights defenders, look on the specific, you know, the, the, it's, it's something I have said to, to the Legal Resources Centre, uh, who I think had addressed you, that I think we need to engage um, back home on, on the, the, the issue. Obviously there are rights of, of freedom of expression, rights to protest and, and, and so on. South Africans are... Um, do protest quite regularly. And in those protests, um, there is very often damage to property. So for example, as you may be aware, we are having protests at many of our universities. Um, at the, currently it's relating to the universities outsourcing uh, is, is the main point of disagreement. It does also release, re relate to financial exclusions, although most of those have been addressed. But in the course of that process, one of the university campuses, the University of Northwest in Mafeking, has been closed down because the administration building was set alight and uh, considerable damage caused. Uh, considerable damage at the University of KwaZulu-Natal, the Westville campus last year. Uh, Free State University as, as well. Um, you will sometimes find a community protests about access roads and in doing so damages property like a school or a library. Um, so we also need to recognize that during protests, property does get damaged. I read a report um, of a community in KwaZulu-Natal yesterday that had protested, I'm not sure what it was about, probably a service delivery issue, and they had damaged a factory, which provides employment for people. Um, so I, I think we need to engage exactly um, you know, where the problems uh, are. With regard to the specific cases that um, the, the, the Angie Peters case, um, Angie Peters was convicted and sentenced. Um, uh, the, I'm not sure of the exact sentence. With the Free State matter, they were convicted of attending an illegal gathering and uh, malicious injury to property. Now, I, I don't, I've never heard anybody criticizing the fairness of our legal uh, system. So, um, if people disagree with a sentence, uh, they can appeal. And, and I'm not sure what is happening, whether there are, I think in the free state matter there are appeals, which would be to a higher court. Um, ultimately, it's the um, uh, Supreme Court of Appeal and then the Constitutional Court even uh, that, that, or the Constitutional Court, which is the, the highest court, and the, const the Constitution was amended not so long ago to empower the Constitutional Court to hear any matter that they want to. It doesn't have to be relating to a constitutional issue. But I, I, I think um, we'd, we'd either, well, we'd, we will be engaging with, with um, civil society organizations back home uh, on the... Um, on the process uh, um, on the issue because it's not something which we are understanding too well uh, where the concerns are. On the Protection of Personal Information Act, um, that act, the, the, the initial delay in, in the implementation of that act was uh, relating to an internal matter of, of the grading of the information regulator. 
uh, when that was resolved um, and um, you know when that was resolved about how much they should be paid the matter was referred to the National Assembly uh, to um, uh, to to um, uh, to appoint the information regulator uh, we are hopeful that they will be appointed in uh, the next few months and they then can start establishing uh, the, the, the infrastructure. Um, with regard to political party funding, um, you know, it is, there has been some debate in South Africa. There was in fact a court case um, pretty recently where um, there was a request that government be compelled to provide legislation uh, to, to monitor party funding. Um, as far as I recall, the outcome of the case was not in support of the application, and the view was that uh, the applicants should have made use of the uh, Promotion of Access to Information Act to request detail on, on party funding. But it is an issue that we are, we are debating uh, in, in, in the country. Um, I think that's, that's sort of largely... Um, what I can respond to. Um, maybe just one issue, I know the Director General of, of Judicial Affairs will cover it, but on the issue of legislation and languages, um, there is a requirement that bills have to be in two official languages, any two of the official languages, um, before they are assented to by the President. Um, that is not necessarily automatically English and Afrikaans. Generally, a bill is, is one of the languages is by practice is English, but it then varies. It's any of the other 10 languages uh, the other version will, will, will be in. Um, though they follow, apparently they follow a roster, so there is an attempt to, to spread it. It's not just English or Afrikaans. The Constitution is, is available in all 11 official languages and it is even in available in Braille. Um, the Braille version is rather uh, thick. Um, but, uh, yeah, so just let me add those points. Um, thanks, Minister. Thanks, uh, Chairperson. Uh, I'm going to deal with the, start with the rigid criteria recognized by some communities. This matter has been submitted to us back at home. On the 2nd of March, the National Question Council appeared before the portfolio committee that is considering the bill. And uh, this issue was submitted. And uh, it will be considered when the whole process is, is, is you know, it's finalized. However, it is intended to ensure that, because the Khoisan people are recognized for the first time, it is intended to make sure that people can self-identify themselves because they are all over the country and so on. In order to have um, a traditional community and so on, some of the criteria, if, if, it is not, um, if it is not something that is going to help, I think during the process of consultation and hearings uh, in parliament, they'll also consider that. We have also looked at that. Uh, that there are also views that the bill is in reinforcing apartheid boundaries. <coughs> Traditional leaders do not have boundaries. We have local government that has wall-to-wall -wall boundaries, constitutional boundaries. Traditional leadership has jurisdictional areas. And those jurisdictional areas sometimes overlap into two uh, uh, municipal areas and those kinds of things. And they, we refer to them as soft boundaries really, and so on. So what the Constitution recognized was, was what was in, in existence. So people are saying, you know, we should perhaps relook at that. So on the issue of self-identification, people that are outside that jurisdictional area that live outside of that and so on, and uh, perhaps if they identify themselves with that traditional community and so on, we should consider looking at self-identification as we are applying the same criteria with the Khoisan people. Um, the, the issue of why Khoisan language is not promoted, why are they tw the 12 languages? The, the, the Khoisan heritage and languages and so on were destroyed in the 1800s. 
by 1910, um, it was decided that the Khoisan people, because they did not have any high heritage or language, they will be referred to as Kalas from that time. And uh, by 1996, when we had our constitution, uh, their language was not codified. And that is why section six is talking about the Khoi, Nama, and San that has to be developed. So many of those languages are not even written and so on. However, we have uh, the Pan South African Language Board that is supposed to develop these languages, like alongside the other African languages that are not well developed. As far as the, the quotas for the fishing rights, which have been taken away, we will make a submission, written submission. And uh, also the issue of considering land, land claims beyond 2013 will also make a written submission. Thank you. Thank you, thank you, Chairperson. Thank you, Minister. I will deal with some of the issues that have been raised with regard to asylum seekers and refugees and their treatment in South Africa. Um, and I'll deal with the questions um, with regard to the asylum seeker period, the asylum transit periods. Uh, according to why is it issued for five days now instead of 14 days? The amended uh, Refugee Act allows uh, for five days to apply for asylum in our refugee centers. Most asylum seekers that come into the country <coughs> enter South Africa through our northeastern border, and in particular our Libombo border post and our Whitebridge border post. Our current um, uh, refugee reception centers that we have is, is we have one that is situated or located in Lucina, which is about uh, 10 kilometers from the border area, from the Bridge border area. And we believe that all first time applicants coming into South Africa would, would be able to reach the, uh, the, the refugee reception center within the period, within a period of, uh, of, uh, of five days. We also, we will also be, uh, when they enter through the Limbombo, Limbombo border post, uh, you can traverse or travel from the Libombo border post to the nearest refugee reception center, which is in Pretoria, within five days. In fact, you can do that within a day. You would be able to apply at a refugee reception center uh, in, in South Africa. So we do believe that we have a spread of reception centers near the areas where people come into the country um, historically, and uh, that they would be able to apply within, within, within five days. In the past, we had a problem where with the 14 days, people would come into the country, roam around, look for a job, uh, do everything, and we would not be aware that they are asylum seekers coming into the country to claim asylum until, of course, they are arrested for being undocumented in the country, and then they would then claim uh, asylum at that particular period of in time. Uh, with regard to the question of uh, uh, whether there are safeguards for asylum seekers that do not have documentations when they enter South Africa, indeed, every asylum seeker that comes in at our ports of entry and makes his intent, his or her intention known that they would like to apply for asylum in the country are issued with an asylum transit permit that allows them to enter the country and to travel to the nearest asylum seeker center to apply for, uh, to apply for asylum. Um, the Refugee Act also allows for entry into South Africa without documentation. So if someone comes into the country using the border line, instead of a, a border post or a port of entry and enter South Africa for the purpose of applying for asylum, uh, such people cannot be arrested. Uh, and upon arrest, because they do not have documentation, if they inform the arresting official that they are in South Africa to claim asylum, it is the responsibility of that arresting official or the authorities 
to transport them to the nearest asylum seeker center where they can then apply for, apply for asylum. Uh, with regard to the uh, allegation about Bitebridge not issuing asylum transit, uh, transit uh, visas, uh, we would like to take up that issue because where we do find uh, it is not policy or state policy, it might be linked to corrupt practices or some officials that are just, uh, that are not implementing the law and in such cases we would investigate and deal appropriately with officials that are, are found to be behaving in a corrupt manner or denying uh, asylum seekers their rights. Um, there are some questions uh, uh, that deal with the proposed new legal framework uh, for refugees that is uh, for, for, for refugees and uh, in the shadow reports and with regard to the questions being asked uh, in terms of how we deal with, uh, with, with stateless person or the conferring of, uh, of naturalization on, on refugees and asylum seekers. Um, these, um, I can say that the new, the new Refugee Act or the proposed Refugee Act has been workshopped and consulted on by the department with uh, the NGO sector. They have made uh, comments on it. They've made some proposals on it. We have uh, included some of the proposals in the in the in the the proposed legislation that will be before Parliament. And the Parliament also has a constitutional. So the South African Parliament has a constitutional <laughs> responsibility to consult when considering legislation. So they will have another. Uh, a chance to participate at a parliamentary level uh, when the proposed new proposed uh, um, uh, policy or sorry uh, bill on refugees will be going through uh, through parliament and we would be able to deal with some of the issues that came out of here with regard to statelessness unaccompanied minors uh, and the issue around the dependence of refugees that have come up in the in the shadow reports and on some of the questions that were raised uh, that were raised here, with regard to Lindella and uh, why are deportees concentrated in one facility? South in South Africa, deportees are kept at different locations. And if I could just explain uh, shortly the process, where de where undocumented migrants are arrested in provinces. And these undocumented migrants come from a, a country that abuts that province. For instance, in free state, if Basutu uh, undocumented migrants are arrested in, in the free state, such undocumented migrants are taken directly or deported directly from the province to the country abutting them. Should they be arrested in Limpopo, they are not transferred to Lindela, but they are transported directly to the Bite Bridge border and they are handed over to Zimbabwean, to the Zimbabwean authorities. The, the Lindela repatriation center is kept for those or is, would be, we would find in them mostly um, those from the neighboring countries or from the region that have been arrested within the Gauteng area, as well as those that have been undocumented migrants that have been arrested in the rest of South Africa, but do not come from the Sadek region, but or our immediate neighbors, but come from uh, further or uh, countries further to the north and those from Southeast Asia or anywhere else in the world that would need to be removed out of South Africa by using air transport, uh, we would then keep those at Lindela. So uh, there is no, it is, uh, 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 there are various other places then where, where asylum seekers are kept, oh, sorry, not asylum seekers, migra undocumented migrants are kept uh, before they are they are deported out of South Africa. 
Uh, on the question of will the new legal framework deal with naturalization, I thought I, I, I spoke to that with regard to 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 uh, the changes that will that is going through our parliament, and we would be able to deal with those issues um, or consider such proposals when it goes through the parliamentary process. Um, on the question uh, that Mr. Seetul Singh uh, asked around information that asylum seekers has adequate access to health and psycho, uh, uh, psycho uh, social services. Um, an asylum seeker has, and a refugee in South Africa has all the rights <coughs> on, I mean, they have all the rights or similar rights that South Africans have, except of course the right to, to vote political rights. Uh, so if any one of them is in need of any services from the state, they are able to go to the relevant departments for such services, just like any South African would, because uh, they, they, uh, they have similar rights uh, uh, as South Africans, and they also have, have access to similar, to similar services from the state. Uh, with regard to the amendments made to the Refugee Act and what they are, again, that is, uh, is linked, I think, to the process of the, uh, the amendments. We, we, will, we will make available uh, to you the, the amended Refugee Act uh, that will be going through Parliament uh, within the next 48 hours uh, so that you would be able to peruse what these changes are. With regard to the right to work, under the current asylum seeker uh, uh, regime, when an asylum seeker applies for a status of refugee uh, in South Africa, the document that is given to them or issued to them that confers on them the status of an asylum seeker also has the condition thereon that they can work and study in South Africa. So there is no restriction on refugee, sorry, asylum seekers in South Africa with, with regard to the right to work and study. Um, um, because we do not practice or we do not have an encampment policy in South Africa and we promote uh, integration of asylum seekers and refugees into South African society, they would need, need to be able to sustain themselves. And the only way that they could do that is they, if they have the right to work uh, in South Africa. So there is no, uh, we do not curtail uh, their right to work uh, in, in South Africa. Um, who has uh, jurisdictional oversight uh, over Lindela? Um, the Human Rights Council, the South African Human Rights Commission, I'm sorry, Commission in South Africa has, um, uh, has oversight over Lindela. They have an office at Lindela and they, have, uh, and they, are, uh, they, they are there on a daily basis and they have access to all activities and all and, and the center at, the, at, at, at Lindela. Uh, I could also, um, the, our, the South African Parliament through its um, oversight committees, parliamentary oversight committees, also has oversight over Lindela. Our, uh, the, the portfolio committee on, on Home Affairs would have oversight over Lindela. They visit it regularly as their oversight function and give reports in Parliament about conditions at Lindela. And the International Red Cross also visits Lindela regularly and, has a, and, and inspects conditions at the, at the center. Where uh, such, such we, we do meet regularly with these uh, with the South African, with the International Red Cross as well as the uh, South African uh, 
Human Rights uh, Commission to discuss these issues and how we can better or make, uh, or if they have any proposals, we take them into consideration and implement them uh, at Lindera. Uh, Chairperson, um, with regard to the closure of the refugee centers in PE and in Cape Town, a decision was taken by the department, I think in 2013, to close uh, these centers. Uh, these, the, the closure has subsequently been challenged in uh, our, our courts in South Africa. We had appeared, the courts had given instruction for, uh, for these offices to be reopened. We appealed the decision that it went to the, uh, to the, uh, our constitutional court where again, the constitutional court ordered the, the Department of Home Affairs to open up the office in, in Port Elizabeth. Um, we have <laughs> received that order. We, have, we are in the process of opening the office in PE, in PE but it is on, uh, there are certain uh, issues that needs to be clarified, or not clarified, but there, there's the issue of a site to open the refugee center in PE. We had uh, uh, an office space to open it, but before we could open it, we had challenges from the business people within that particular area stating that they would not, it would impact on their business if we should bring asylum seekers to, uh, uh, in that particular building to apply for asylum there. And we were then forced uh, to move uh, to another or to look for, for alternative uh, uh, space or, or offices to be op able to open the PE office. We need to report to the Constitutional Court monthly on these matters in terms of progress of opening these offices, and we are in the process of doing that. We have just given a report to the, uh, 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 in March to the Constitutional Court outlining the challenges that we have with regard to opening the office. But we are in the process of reopening, uh, reopening these offices. <coughs> Um, I thought I would just talk to the issue around the conventions on, uh, on, on, on statelessness and uh, uh, that has also been raised in terms of will this find its way into the natural, uh, sorry, the, the national law of South Africa. With regard to the 1954 statelessness convention and the 1961 convention on the reduction of statelessness, uh, South Africa has not yet signed or ratified um, uh, these, these conventions. Uh, I can say that the South African government is in the process of considering these, these conventions and we are putting in place certain prerequisites um, be, uh, for the signing of these conventions uh, and we will, I'm sure at our next, uh, uh, we would be able to report on progress on this particular matter. Chairperson, I, I think I, I covered if there's any other issue, um, I, will, I will come back to. Uh, if, I, if I may also just mention the, uh, that with regard to the appeal backlog and uh, the number of applications that are at the ap appeals uh, um, uh, pro process, uh, back in, in uh, the asylum appeals process, uh, we will respond within 48 hours with regard to, uh, to the number uh, of, of, of appeal applications that have not been de dealt with yet. Thank you, Chairperson. Okay, thank you, Chairperson. Um, I want to first of all respond to the request for disaggregated data on our various centers. Um, we can certainly provide that. It's, it's data that we use in our national and regional overcrowding task teams which look at the distribution of inmates um, to deal with the disproportionate distribution. Um, where possible, we obviously look at moving inmates from, faci of, from facilities that are overcrowded to less overcrowded facilities. 
However, with remand detainees, that's often not possible given they need to be close to, to the courts. With regard to sentenced offenders, what we do need to take into account before people are being moved is obviously their closeness to their communities and family, which is critical for, for their ultimate successful reintegration. Um, we are uh, prioritizing areas for building of new facilities where we have the most overcrowding. Um, with regard to, to Polsmoor, we've, we've very seriously considered the report that was done by Judge Cameron of the Constitutional Court. Uh, he visited our, that facility in terms of a very important oversight mechanism that we have in our law. Um, following this report and, and looking at the issues that were raised in, in our own assessments, uh, Polsmoor was in fact entirely emptied out. Every single inmate was, was moved to another facility for a short period of time to deal with some of the issues that, that had been raised there. there have been a, there's been a subsequent visit from uh, another judge of the Constitutional Court. We are awaiting his report, but it seems to be a lot more positive than, than the previous one. Um, we've also had a visit from uh, the Judicial Inspectorate of Correctional Services who have indicated that they've seen a lot of improvement. And we've invited um, and have in fact had visits both from the NGO as well as the Lawyers for Human Rights that are representing them in the litigation dealing with Polsmoor. Uh, the overcrowding remains an issue. Polsmoor is not as overcrowded as it was before the intervention, um, but it is certainly still uh, something that we are, are looking at. There are a number of uh, interventions that I think we will submit um, uh, in, in, in more detail um, within the 48 hours. But I think just to, to sort of look at some of them, it's the, the increase in a maintenance budget given that the overcrowding means that maintenance is, becomes more of an issue. We've looked at staffing, uh, especially professional staffing, and we have increased our staffing specifically of nurses and psychologists within that centre fundamentally. There's a new pharmacy that has opened there and we have looked at better waste disposal and, and laundry facilities. Um, we, we do battle with the, the issue of uh, our infrastructure that uh, obviously far older than, than, than 90, before, well, obviously most of it was built before 1994 and certainly not with any kind of focus on rehabilitation. It was kind of a, a lock up and go. And although our policies and legislation have changed, we are still stuck with buildings that, that perpetuate far more uh, that approach th rather than rehabilitation. So we do have challenges when it comes to, to, to issues of exercise. Um, we have dealt with some of that by, by trying to create more space within that, um, as well as ventilation issues. All of these issues will be addressed when we, when we look at new facilities and certainly the area of uh, within the Western Cape, we are, are looking at a new remand detention facility in the coming years. There are two new facilities that have been built uh, within the Western Cape. Uh, they are awaiting final, final uh, allocation of resources and some few minor adjustments to the infrastructure, but will create an additional uh, 600 odd, odd bed spaces, which, which of course will, will alleviate some of the issues. Um, we are, uh, particularly in the Western Cape, uh, affected very much by, by gangsterism, which is both within the, the centres themselves as well as gangs that come from the outside. That also impacts on our on our ability to to deal with things like exercise because we need to divide people far more in in, 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 um, in uh, when when we do uh, take them outside of their cells to be mixing with others. Um, the issue on on overcrowding generally, I think I dealt with some of it yesterday, but uh, there were specific concerns now raised. I think regarding the over two years, how are we reducing over two years? Um, there is a. Uh, what is called the Office for the Criminal Justice Review, which includes many of the, the departments affected uh, or part of the criminal justice system, as well as legal aid and uh, business against crime. And they, we do look at very particular projects um, dealing particularly with delays within the criminal justice system. We've started a project at looking specifically of those over two years. Um, we have started to gather figures on that following our, the implementation of 49G of our act um, which looks at the very specific referral of anybody within our centres that is um, in remand for longer than two years where we are obliged to refer them to the court for reconsideration of their continued detention. Um, it's, there's also a, a section within our Criminal Procedure Act that allows at any time for, for a judge or magistrate to consider the length of detention and to consider whether continued detention um, is, is, is uh, justifiable. 
we have, um, in, with regard to the, the sections, we are also obviously looking at barriers that are there that are of an operational nature. So those that are with bail that are returned to our center, we are entering into agreements with Legal Aid South Africa to be able to inform them of the, of, of the people that are still with us, although they've been granted bail in order to deal with that. Um, with relation to the electronic monitoring, we, we certainly see it as, as, a, as, as something that can be used in terms of reduction of remand detainees. Um, we, we did, however, say that we need to have uh, greater cooperation both within the cluster and the judiciary in terms of how that can be used. So last month, the protocol, um, after substantial uh, consultation, has, is now being signed by all of the heads of department uh, relating to that. Um, on the issue of the Luanda guidelines, we've been part of the, a number of workshops that have been taking place in South Africa held by the African um, Policing Civilian Oversight Forum. And we've given input into the, the ways in which the Luanda guidelines can be applied and how uh, we can be measured by that. So we've, we've talked about indicators, we've talked about performance of the department. So, so um, we, we certainly um, are looking at fully implementing that. Um, the issue of Grundpunt, um, yes, there, there, were, there were major challenges. The, the South African Human Rights Commission, when they issued those recommendations, we looked at that and, and there were primarily two issues that we needed to look at, the provision of food and the issue of attending to complaints of inmates. Um, the provision of food, we have had serious infrastructural issues. We have, for that reason, outsourced um, the, the, the production of food or the provision of food to inmates while we deal with those, those issues and the Department of Public Works is specifically looking at putting something in place that takes into account the, the center itself um, and the age of the center in, in, in particular. Um, and with the complaints of inmates there has been uh, substantial progress and I think we, we've, we've, we've managed to deal with that. In addition, the, the uh, overcrowding at Grundpunt is, is currently at 127%, uh, which, is, which is below our um, national average. Um, I think I have dealt with most of the issues. The, the definition of juveniles uh, for correctional services, we don't detain any children under the age of 14. So our um, uh, groups are from 18 to, uh, sorry, from 14 to 17, we consider children which with very specific legislation applying to them. From 18 to 20, juveniles, which we also um, attempt, in, uh, at if at all possible, to keep separate from adults and from 21 um, over as, as adults. Um, there were some issues, I think it was uh, just a comment in response to our queries on, on some of the cases that were raised. Um, I know that there was a mention of Mangaung. Uh, Bloemfontein tends to refer to the same, it is, tends to be the same. I think that requires a very substantive uh, uh, input, so we will certainly do that within the, the, the 48 hours. I, I think I have covered most of it. Thank you. Th th thank you, Chairperson. Uh, my apologies, there were one or two uh, issues that I did not uh, uh, touch on. One of them was the uh, question by, uh, by Mr. Sitol Singh on whether refugees um, are at risk of being deported to countries where they are at risk of being harmed. Firstly, refugees are not deported. Refugees are, have legal status in South Africa. So there is no refugee that will be deported anywhere because they reside and live in South Africa. I suppose what we are referring to here is, an, is a failed asylum seeker. Now, if we are referring to a failed asylum seeker, a failed asylum seeker, according to our law, has recourse. One, he can appeal the decision, uh, and upon uh, if his appeal is, is not successful, he can then take it on judicial review in South Africa. And only when he has gone through those appeal processes, which will ensure uh, whether he has a claim for asylum or not, and if he, he or she is then a failed asylum seeker, it would then mean that such person can be returned to their home country. And because they have left it, not because of persecution, there would be no grounds for persecution. So there is the appeals process uh, for that particular uh, uh, 
uh, I mean for failed asylum seekers, but I reiterate that asylum seekers and refugees are not being deported, are not being deported out of, out of South Africa. Um, with regard to information on, information on the measures taken to ensure that migrants, including unaccompanied minors, are not arbitrarily detained and that the detention of persons pending deportation is not excessively protected, uh, protracted, sorry, the Immigration Act does not allow for detentions in excess of 30 days unless a magistrate authorizes such for an, for an additional 90 days. And in order to obtain an extension of 30 days, the deportee must be informed on day 20 that they are likely to have the detention extended and then given three days to make representation. By day 25, the extension application should be placed before court for consideration, and if any of these procedures are not followed, the deportee must be released from detention. At day 120, the deportee must be released if they are not deported. Now, why are migrants, undocumented migrants, detained? They are detained for the purpose of nationality checks by the embassies, as well as the issuance of travel documents by the embassy. And they are kept at, at, the, deten at the center, the repatriation center, until that process has been, has, been, has been done. It is not in the interest of the South African government to keep them longer than the 30 days, but where there is a necessity because there, there, there is still an issue of the nationalities, being, be, being confirmed by the embassies and the documents being, travel documents being issued, they are then kept for longer periods. But if that process is not completed uh, within a 120 day period, such uh, 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 people are then, or migrants are then released and they are then asked to report regularly to the Department of Home Affairs officials or inspectorate officials until that process has been completed. Regarding unaccompanied minors and vulnerable groups, the department places such persons in places of safety uh, with our Department of Social Development and they, we do not detain, detain such persons. No migrants are detained unless it is made clear to them that they are being detained due to suspicions about their status, and this can only be for up to 48 hours, and in that time, the of officials are required to assist the person to verify their status before it is finally confirmed that the person is in the country undocumented. And you can only then be transferred to the Lindela Repatriation Center after all of those checks have been done, meaning that people finding themselves at the Lindela Repatriation Center could be people that who, who has been in, who, where an investigation has proved that they do not have the necessary documentation to be in South Africa. I thank you, Chair. two additional areas that I'd forgotten to cover. The one was the question of legal aid. Um, it is available to, um, um, well, basically a person must have representation in a uh, criminal matter if I think the wording is a, a substantial injustice may result if they don't. Um, the legal aid is awarded to people who uh, do not have the means to employ their own um, legal representatives. Uh, that is set, um, the amount that's at, at in question is set in terms of the legal aid guide, which is approved by, by parliament. Um, legal aid can also be available for people in civil matters as well, as uh, we've, they are, we are attempting to roll it out for, for, to make it available for civil matters. Uh, the problem isn't so much the indigent, in, indigent uh, as far as legal representation. The problem is more people earning some money 
who don't qualify for legal aid, um, but who would battle to afford a lawyer. And in terms of the newly passed Legal Practice Act, uh, which is also in the process of being implemented, the South African Law Reform Commission is tasked to uh, in run an investigation on the high cost of litigation in, in South Africa. Uh, the other question was on the issue of the um, what's, a, what's a juvenile or a child. In terms of the Child Justice Act, we don't use the term juvenile, we use the term child. A child is a person under the age of 18. The act applies to them if the process commenced before they had turned 18. And the process would commence in, in a minor case where they get a notice to come and appear, uh, or they get a summons, or they get arrested. So as long as that they received that before they were 18, um, the act would then apply to them. Um, there is also a provision that the director of uh, prosecutions, provincial chief director as it were, um, can direct if the crime was committed before the person was 18 and they are under 21 years uh, at the time of the process, the legal process is starting, the um, chief prosecutor can direct that the person be dealt with in terms of the Child uh, Justice uh, Act. Um, it has seen a substantial reduction in the numbers of people, of children. I mean, the aim of it is diversion. Um, and um, the numbers of people uh, being sentenced to imprisonment in prison uh, or uh, in, a correct, in a secure care facility has reduced substantially. Um, we have um, 31 secure care facilities available in South Africa for children in trouble with the law with a bed capacity of 2,696. Uh, we can then supply, I think you'd asked for the uh, provincial breakdown and we can supply, uh, we can supply that. Uh, maybe one point which wasn't referred to but just to say that the age of criminal capacity is currently 10 in South Africa. In terms of the Child Justice Act there had to be a review. Uh, that review has been completed and will be tabled in Parliament and the proposal which we hope Parliament will accept will be increasing the age of criminal capacity from uh, 10 to 12. Uh, with a rebuttable presumption between 12 and 14. Currently it's 10 and the rebuttable presumption is 10 to 14. Uh, so that, that process is, is, is now moving. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, Chair. Can I just uh, speak to some of the beneficiaries who have been asked questions? Thank you very much indeed for the information that you've been providing. Are there any colleagues from the committee who wish to ask the floor? If you do take the floor, may I ask you to speak very briefly because we only have a couple of minutes left and we still need to make time for concluding remarks uh, on the part of the delegation, of course. I give the floor to Sir Nigel. Thank you very much and I'm very mindful of uh, the time and your position in trying to manage it. Um, uh, just uh, a couple of words, one relating to issue 20, uh, I take it you'll, uh, on the question of deaths in custody, uh, I take it you'll get that information when uh, in writing after the uh, session. <coughs> I do want to say, if I may, that South Africa has made a really important contribution to prisoner protection in the form of the Intergovernmental Expert Group that took place in Cape Town in March of last year, which has led to a wholesale revision of the UN standard minimum rule for the treatment of prisoners, which are now, by decision of the General Assembly, to be called the Nelson Mandela Rule. In honor of that meeting, I had the pleasure and the privilege and honor of being part of that meeting and wanted to pay homage to South Africa for uh, making an important contribution to the protection of prisoners worldwide. The other point is one that embarrasses me to raise at this stage but one of the members of the delegation uh, raised the issue of SADC, um, South African Development Corporation, uh, at, uh, um, and um, uh, a, a, a cooperation organization. And uh, I would really like to know if possible uh, from the delegation, of course in writing you have a copy of it, um, what reasons South Africa had uh, for going along with first the uterine by removing the last finger of the physician and then the dissolution of the SADC tribunal 
uh, in the wake of a very important human rights decision that had made the best of the EU post the battle. Uh, this can be because of the reach of the Convention on Human Rights and the human rights violations that are very important. And it's a very healthy human rights violation, uh, right or left or wrong, if the uh, dis uh, dissolution of this particular proposed and the following Thank you very much, Sir Nigel. Mr. Mohumusa. Uh, thank you very much. And uh, uh, quickly, I'd like to commend uh, the South African government uh, for the judicial system because I've not quite had many people criticizing it. It's really commendable. I agree. However, one of the ingredients of a working judicial system is the investigative arm. Quite often, this is the police and the office of the prosecutor. Also, it goes without saying. And any attempt to politicize prosecutions must be resisted at every cost. The other important uh, uh, variable, of course, would be the bar association, the bar association, defense counsel should not only be available, they should be access, accessible and affordable as well. Uh, we have heard a little bit of how you stand and it's commendable that you are even trying to stretch it to the uh, civil matters. But back to the judicial system, please keep it that way. Keep it independent because everyone benefits from an impartial judiciary, particularly when one becomes a private citizen and may no longer benefit from the vestiges of state power. We all benefit by a judicial uh, a judiciary that is uh, independent. I thank you. Gracias. Thank you very much, Ms. Cleveland. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and again, I would like to thank the delegation for their very detailed responses. Uh, my question also involves the Mandela rules that Sir Nigel just mentioned. Uh, and one issue that I'm not entirely sure if we adequately addressed was the issue of solitary confinement. We have reports um, that at least two facilities in South Africa, the CMAX facility and the Ebangweni uh, Supermax prison, um, detain prisoners in conditions that would qualify as solitary confinement under the Mandela rules, and we would welcome information from the state party regarding that, its accuracy, um, and the reasons therefore. Um, and that obviously can be in writing. It doesn't need to be now. So thank you. Muchas gracias. Thank you very much. Mr. Shani. substantial injustice uh, standard, uh, just to highlight that the, the covenant uses uh, interest of justice, which may be a somewhat different uh, standard. Um, and, and specifically, I would appreciate any clarifications whether the substantial injustice or interest of justice standard would also apply in immigration cases, namely uh, whether uh, in, in, asylum, uh, in asylum determination proceedings, uh, whether if the interest of justice uh, so require, they would be legally permissible. Thank you very much. I now get the floor to Her Excellency, Mr. Shabangu, so that she may impart unto us her concluding remarks after the dialogue you've had. You have the floor, Your Excellency. Thank you very much, Chairperson. On behalf of the South African delegation, I would like to thank you, the Vice Chairperson, the Secretariat, and the distinguished committee members for the effective and conducive manner in which this dialogue took place. We also thank the South African Human Rights Commission as well as civil society organizations for their contributions to this review. This is a special year for us in South Africa 
as we celebrate the 20th anniversary of our Constitution. This brings with it a renewed commitment to the attainment and advancement of human rights in our country. If people are not aware of their human rights and how to exercise these rights, a constitution simply becomes a set of empty promises on paper. Therefore, we have rolled out a number of programs aimed at constitutional education and human rights awareness in our country. We must also indicate that the covenant contains many provisions that are aligned to the, our constitutions and laws and policies that explicate the constitution. Hence, this year, as we celebrate the 21st of March, which we commemorate as Human Rights Day, which will be held on the 21st of March, we have adopted a theme which says, National Day, uh, National Day Against Racism, but also we adopted the following slogans, Racism, not in my name, racism, not in my country. We appreciate the many observations and comments made during this dialogue regarding our efforts towards the realization of rights enshrined in the covenant. We have taken considerable notes of the questions posed as well as the recommendations made and have found this process to be conducive to assisting states to improve their human rights policies <coughs> and programs. We are in particular thankful to the committee members for their valuable inputs and constructive engagement. As we have stated in our opening statement, we have developed processes to consult with civil society with respect to many other reports. We will also do so going forward with reports to this committee as well. We hope that we were able to answer the questions addressed to us in a comprehensive manner. Those questions upon which we have provided we will provide more detail, we will endeavor to submit in writing, and we look forward to the concluding observations. Once more, we take this opportunity to thank you, Mr. Chairperson, and the members of the committee. Thank you very much, Ms. Shavanku, Mr. Landers, and the whole delegation. Thank you for the dialogue. It's the very first time that you've appeared before this committee, and I can say that we were very happy with the information that you provided during the course of the meeting. Of course, you will be receiving our concluding observations, and we will be raising some concerns that remain and uh, some other observations which remain relevant if you want to fully enjoy civil and political rights in the country. We take good note of the strong commitment in the state party to combat racism, and it couldn't be otherwise in a country that uh, has testified to uh, such struggle against uh, the terrible practice of apartheid. We feel compelled to emphasize how important it is to prevent any kind of torture or inhuman, uh, cruel and degrading treatment. And of course, detention conditions are extremely important. It's also very important to safeguard the rights of detainees. Your Excellency will be well aware of the fact that the committee it very much stresses the situation of uh, people in a vulnerable situation, asylum seekers, refugees, etc. We take note of the fact that there is a significant amount of legislation in this respect, but it's also important to practically implement the legislation and make it fully operational and ensure that the situation is dealt with appropriately. As for customary practices, the problem is neither in the past uh, nor in the present. The problem is uh, male chauvinist practices, whether it happens in the past or present or uh, could happen in the future, and that lies at the core of things. Today is the International Women's Day, and it's very important to reflect on that as a result. I'm very concerned when I hear it said that certain practices will not change. 
when certain bodies such as the Committee on the Elimination of Discrimination Against Women or our own committee emphasize how important it is to guarantee the rights of men and women on an equal footing, the rights of uh, civil society and civil rights groups uh, say the same thing. Some comments have been made here and we take good note of the delegation's commitment to increasingly factor in the workings of civil society into its own work and to, to particularly look at the situation of human rights defenders. That being said, it now falls to me to wish you a safe journey home. We're very happy that you've been here with you and we hope to see you soon again without having to wait uh, a good long stretch of years as uh, we've had to wait this time round to see you here before us. You are, of course, your friends. We have uh, a committee meeting, an informal meeting at 2 p.m. on Namibia. This is information for committee members. That will be held in room 181. Thank you very much to all participants of this meeting, including to interpreters who've worked overtime, and uh, thank you to the Secretariat. Meeting stands adjourned.